What's going on, everybody? It is your boy Brandon Leak here for our first installment of a brand new video series that we are doing entitled The Breakdown. And essentially what's going to be happening here is it's going to be a breakdown of different poems, both in their performance and in their meaning lyrically. And so we're going to be looking at videos or in some instances, even just listening to poems while reading the lyrics and breaking down exactly what's going on in the poem, some of the nuances, some of the poetic references in which we will be alluding to in particular aspects of this. You may see me refer to my handy dandy phone here. So that way I can go to some of the notes I've written, things to that nature. And so, uh, I feel it's only fitting that we start off this first ever inaugural episode by going to the poem in which granted me what is the most likely reason why you all know me, which is my poem Puff, my first ever poem and my golden buzzer poem from America's Got Talent season 15. So we're going to start, we're going to watch and, uh, We'll pause here and there so that way we can begin to break down some of the things. So we'll get through some of the uh, pleasantries of what the judges have to say first. What is your name? My name is Brandon Lee. Hi, Brandon Lee. And where are you from, Brandon? I am from a small little city called Stockton, California. Stockton, California. And what do you do for a living? Uh, for a living, I, I work at a high school and a college, but I also run poetry workshops with youth in my city. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I don't really understand poetry, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a great intro for you. I, so t tonight's poem, is it something you wrote? Oh, I only perform stuff that I write, never be able to perform anything else. Well, and what is it, what is this one about? So tonight's poem is actually a, an ode to my sister. Are you close to your sister? Very much. She's here with me now. Oh, she's back backstage? Kind of. <laughs> well, we already love you. Make us love your poem. Beautiful. <laughs> so before the poem even starts, I, uh, I love the facial expressions of the judges. Um, you know, if you, uh, if you are unfamiliar, I want to make sure that I, uh, I address this here at the top. Um, in particular, what an ode is. We'll, we'll give a definition. So uh, an ode, a lyric poem in the form of an address to a particular subject often elevated in style or manner and written in varied or regular meter. Um, and so essentially what an ode is, is just like a, a dedication to someone. It's a poem that particularly addressed to a particular individual or scenario um or place you know what i mean so so yeah this is a first poetic device <laughs> actually for that i have two facts for you one i'm six feet tall <laughs> and two love is the most vulnerable thing one will ever have and you must learn to hold on to it loosely so when it leaves it won't exit so painfully on july 14th 1996 an angel was brought to this earth. Her name, Danielle Marie Gibson, but I only know her as Puff. So we'll stop here. So the, the first line of this poem being, I have two facts for you. One, I'm six feet tall. So me being the writer, I can tell you the intent and desire of this particular line. Uh, nothing lyrically in depth here, but the, the purpose of this was to be somewhat of a, not comical relief because it's not funny, but a somewhat of a pressure valve relief for these judges and the people in the audience who'd be watching. Um, nobody was there because of COVID, but it was essentially a valve release of pressure. So that way they didn't feel the prototypical pressurized emotions that come with the word poetry. Poetry has a lot of um, negative connotation to it when it comes to 
you know, the, the average person. They remember poetry being boring in school or, you know, oh man, like I don't really do poetry. It's too deep. I don't really understand or comprehend a lot of it. That's a lot of response that people usually have when they think about poetry. And so for myself, I wanted to start off with something very lighthearted, somewhat obvious um, that they would be able to latch themselves onto and then immediately proceed afterwards with a line that would then kind of not cut deep, but at least l introduce them to a bit of the theme of what we're coming to. And now what's also being done with this first line, it is, is a, blah, 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 blah. it is a setup for what is called a callback. A callback uh, or an illusion is something in which indirectly refers to something that will then be more clarified later. And so for myself, this callback is going to happen later on in this poem. If you've never watched it, I'm not going to ruin it. If you've watched it, then you know exactly what's coming. Um, and so, yeah, as of so far, just pretty standard free verse poem. If you don't know what a free verse poem is, um, free verse, I want to make sure I read the definition properly so that way nobody, you know, barks down my neck about it. Free verse poems uh, remove the need for both for, uh, for, formal rhyme and formal uh, metric rhythm schemes. This allows the poem to be shaped completely by the poet. Removing this formality often allows the poet a far greater canvas on which to play. So it's essentially just you don't have to rhyme every line. You don't have to stick to a particular cadence or meter. It allows you a lot more freedom to do and go where you so choose in the particular poem. So most spoken word pieces are free verse. You'll hear people say like, oh, you know, I'm, this is a limerick, which has a specific rhyme and meter, or this is a haiku, which has a specific rhyme and meter. And so those types of things. Her smile is as wide as the universe. Her eyes, they glimmer like the star. She is my world and my sister. I, just four years old at the time, learned what it meant to love selflessly for on days in which my strength was but knee high. Seeing her smiling face would make my soul fly. But on March 23rd, 1997, I've been ground bound because she left Earth to go back home amongst the stars, right next to God. But I was left here to manufacture wings out of tears and broken dreams. Yet I'm still haunted by these nightmares because. All right. So we'll stop here. So part of what's happening in this poem right now is a utilization of metaphor and simile to be able to express um, particular things and emotions that are happening. So here we go through a series of lines. Um, her smile is wide as the universe. If you don't know what a simile is, it is a comparison of two or more things using words like, like or as. Um, and then her eyes glimmered like the stars. Another simile utilizes the word like comparing my sister's eyes to stars. Uh, she was my world and my sister. Um, that there being a metaphor, similes and metaphors are like, you know, uh, siblings in this world of poetry. And so essentially what happens here is uh, meta similes use like or ask to compare two things. Metaphors do not use like or ask to compare two or more things. So um, people think that these things are very complicated to make. They're a lot easier uh, once you get the hang of it. Um, it's very like this is a very simple metaphor here. Um, uh, learned what it meant to love selflessly on days in which my strength was but knee high. Seeing her smiling face would make my soul fly. So this could be considered, um, oh man, what is the name of that literary device? Um, it's an exaggeration, but there's another term for it. Let me find it real quick. And the exaggeration here being, uh, on days when my strength was but knee high, seeing her smiling face would make my soul fly. My soul is not literally flying here, but it is, you know, in a metaphorical sense, taking off seeing her joyous face. Um, and so, yeah. I have a really creative mind. And sometimes it designs these alternate realities where she is still here still alive and all the things I wish we could have done are played again and again and again and I'm tired of playing God because I got to come to terms with the fact that my sister ain't never coming back and that's the cost of love 
caring for someone so much that you can't imagine living life without them, staring at a grave like, how about I trade my six feet for yours, but that's not real. So I mentioned earlier, illusions and callbacks. This is the callback. The six feet line being mentioned at the top to now the six feet line being mentioned here at the end, that is the purpose of that setup. So that way it now pulls you back to the beginning of this poem. And now you're like, oh man, this, this was a whole journey I've been on. This is not just a series of random lines being constructed next to each other. No, we've, we've led this here intentionally, on purpose. We know where we're going. And so, yeah, this, uh, that was an, a very intentional thing. This is a skill set that I've learned um, from a myriad of different comedians. The one most notably is Dave Chappelle. Uh, watching Dave Chappelle's content, seeing the way in which he integrates callbacks into a vast majority of his specials is a phenomenal way in which I learned to apply this skill set. Now, there's some other things that, that happen here. And so um, there is the utilization of repetition, playing again and again and again and again. The, the utilization of this repetition is for reinforced emphasis that this is not a singular occurrence but that this is, a, this is something that's genuinely plaguing me, that I'm going through on a consistent basis and that it is, in this instance, ensuring a great deal of turmoil um, and, and making me feel a particular type of way that I'm not desiring to feel. And so the repetition is just a, a further emphasis of this particular emotion that I'm feeling at this moment. And I know I said earlier to hold on to love loosely so when it leaves, it won't exit so painfully. But if this pain and these memories are all that I got left of you, I won't never regret these scars from just trying to hold on to you. So that's the end of the poem. We'll listen to the judge's response and stuff like that uh, in a second. But um, so there's a secondary part of this callback that happens right after the six feet line. Um, I reiterate a line where I reiterate a line where I say, um, I said earlier to hold on to love loosely so when it leaves it won't exit so painfully. Um, that is another setup for the final line, which is the one that's supposed to be, as, as my friend Black Chakra, Black Chakra affectionately says, the kick him in the chest moment. He says that poets do one of two things. They kick you in the back or they kick you in the chest. And he says, I'm a, I'm a master at kicking people in the chest. And this line that comes next where it says, so when it, so, uh, and if this pain and these memories are all that I have left of you, I'll never regret these scars from just trying to hold on to you. So that's the kick them in the chest moment of this poem. So we, we talked about some of the poetic devices and skills. There's some loose rhymes here and there. You'll see them on the side of the screen next to me where rhymes actually occur throughout the course of the poem. They'll be color coded. But um, the, I want to talk about the overall purpose and impact of this poem. So the, the genuine purpose of spoken word is to leave an, an, a singular impression because you get one performance. You get one opportunity to convey your message and to get these people to understand what you are talking about and why this poem is significant and why they should listen to you. And so this poem was to service that indeed purpose, which was to get people to understand my sister's loss and what that did to me, especially at a young age and how it impacted me moving forward with the rest of my life. I, I said that this was an ode to her. Uh, this is actually um, a revised and shortened version of a six-minute poem in which is dedicated to the three people in my life who I've lost um, who had the greatest impact on me, that being my sister, my grandfather, and my best friend slash brother Bernard. Um, and so, yeah, this poem was meant to be a great deal of heart. You may notice that I mentioned some, you know, literary devices here in this poem that take place. I may have missed some, but for the most part, I think I got to all of them. It displays skill, but it, I would not say that this is, you know, in terms of its craftsmanship, 
the, you know, a lyrical masterpiece of a poem, but that does not have to be the intent of a poem. Poems can service the function of being able to just make people feel. And I think that poets sometimes can lose track of that. I think that we can lose track of how important the emotional connection between what we're doing and the people who are listening to us and how important that engagement is. Because guess what? We do this art to connect and engage with people. And when I talk to people and they give me their responses to this poem, oftentimes what they tell me is that this poem was universal for them. It didn't matter that I was talking about my sister, they filled in the blank for themselves. They put their aunt in it. They put their uncle, their mom, their father, their grandma, grandpa, their cousin, brother, sister, best friend, whoever may have passed, that's who they put in the position of my sister in this poem, and that is what they connected to. And that's the beauty of art. And if you wanna see further proof of how a poem structured in this way to be able to pull on people's heartstrings and emotions by, you know, painting the picture, you know, using, using detailed imagery to be able to try to convey like, oh, hey, you know, like this is why this person was important to me. Like her smile lit up my world. It was my universe. Her eyes, they glimmered like the stars. They were my guiding light um, of a sense. And these are just like things that people associate with these things, right? Um, she would make my soul fly, but now I've been ground bound, right? Like that imagery of like seeing something, you know, rise to the skies, but then now being brought back down to earth and the association that we have with that. Um, I was left here to manufacture wings out of tears and broken dreams, right? Like that's something in which you could imagine in your mind as I'm saying these lines. Um, yet I'm still haunted by these nightmares because I have a really creative mind and it designs these alternate realities where you are still here, still alive. That's something in which I know is an emotion that almost everyone can resonate with. And if you can create poetry that has a universal appeal while also still being specific, I think that you have a great recipe for success. But if you don't believe me, let's listen to what the judges got. Wow. It is a wow. Flowers across the sea. Memories are what they used to be. Wait, turn again. My brother passed away the same year that your sister passed away. Man. Yeah, I can feel your pain. I know what this is. I know what it is to have somebody taken from you without you knowing. But it was very beautiful for me. And that's what I mean, right? Like for Sophia here, this was her brother that she put in the place of this poem. Like she directly told you like, it may have been your sister, but it was my brother. When I heard this poem, I thought about my brother. And so let's keep listening. What an amazing tribute. There's something very, very special about you. Thank you. Really. This is a very difficult thing for me to judge. I shouldn't be judging it. I just want to compliment you on what you just did because it was uh, extraordinary. Thank you for so much. Really? So much. Well, it's amazing to me. That and that's coming from a guy who just said, I'm really not into poetry. On season 15, it's the first time that we're hearing somebody of spoken word. There was something more raw in the way it's like singing and talking and just being a human a cappella. No music, no nothing, just a raw heart beating in front of us. We feel your pain, we feel your love, and you moved me to do this. So, there you have it. Um, my first ever poetry breakdown. Um, you'll see the rhyme schemes happening over to the side of me. I don't know if it'll be this side or this side. I'm just pointing this side because I'm assuming it's going to be this way. Um, but don't hold me to that. Uh, however, 
Um, yeah, you know, people oftentimes believe that writing spoken word is hard. It can be. To be really good at it takes time, effort, energy, and a whole lot of learning, a whole lot of practice, a whole lot of failing. But it's worth the journey if it's something that you're passionate about. If you want to learn more about being a good writer, I'd highly recommend um, following several really awesome writers and spoken word artists who I know. Um, I'll give you a, a list of 10 names who you can go and watch on YouTube, and none of them are me. These are people who I looked up to and watched. Uh, the legendary Black Ice, Sheehan the Poet, Blues out of North Carolina. Uh, we have Prentice Powell, who's also a phenomenal wordsmith, Rudy Francisco, Javon Johnson, uh, Portia O out of Boston, the Poet Laureate, I believe of Massachusetts or all of Boston, uh, Janae Johnson, uh, I'm trying to think of other ones that I would highly recommend. Um, I would also throw out there to you, I haven't seen her in a while, but Sarah Kay was a really good pen, and then uh, Kat McGill would be my 10th. So those are 10 poets who you can most certainly learn, learn from. They are people who I've most certainly learned from. Oh, uh, Jessica Caramore would be another phenomenal poet and Georgia Me. So that's 12 for you total. So um, yeah, but let me know in the comment section which poem I should do next. It doesn't have to be mine. It could literally be anybody's. And then uh, we'll go ahead and start breaking down these bars. But until then, catch y'all next time.